let us get straight into the topic so this would be the outline of my talk couple of slides on background of sjogren syndrome and renal tubular acidosis and then i would like to focus on the literature review of 440 case reports of sjogren syndrome and rtn published literature focusing on demography clinical and criteria features renal and non renal features now as professor halskofil already mentioned there are two very important aspects to diagnosis of sjogren syndrome one is the presence of antibody and second is presence of lymphocytic infiltration of exocrine glands sicca is the most well known symptom of sjogren syndrome it may not be the most common there are distinctive extra glandular features rta is one such manifestation rta in sjogren syndrome was first described in 1965 now what is the underlying pathology of rta in sjogren syndrome this is characterized by tubulo interstitial nephritis there are lymphocytes t more than b cells plasma cells and monocytes infiltrating the renal interstitium tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis are present now if you look carefully at the picture this picture uh, this um, infiltration is very much similar to that seen in the salivary glands so we, with increasing reports of cases of rt in sjogren syndrome and this understanding that the lymphocytic infiltration in renal interstitium is similar to that seen in salivary gland rt was recognized as a inherent component of sjogren syndrome now let us look at the data that is available from retrospective cohorts of sjogren syndrome across the world now this gives us an idea of frequency of rta in different parts of the world in an early chinese study the frequency of rta was 16.7 percentage in a more recent study it is 6 percentage in an indian study this is from cmc velour 8.1 percentage uk 3.9 percentage ular did a 2015 systematic review uh, in which the frequency of rta was uh, 9.3 percentage the largest collection of renal tubular acidosis is from china so this is a chinese study Uh, reported in 2008 journal of rheumatology they looked at 130 patients with renal sjogrens of which 95 had renal tubular acidosis now large other large case series reporting exclusively on sjogren syndrome and renal tubular acidosis uh, this n is 52 is from swims in tirupati and all the large series numbering more than 10 case reports are all from india so despite this literature a comprehensive description of the clinical features are lacking and uh, interestingly for specialist other than rheumatology sjogren syndrome renal tubular acidosis is considered an enigma which may be a good thing because they continue to be uh, to publish the single unique case reports and small series and representation in this is a very unique thing because the representation in case reports possibly outnumber that the data that is available in cohorts and this was the inspiration to systematically compile and analyze all case reports and series of sjogren syndrome renal tubular acidosis and describe the characteristic of sjogren's patients with rta uh, so a systematic search of relevant publications in all languages were undertaken so there is no money so only the free databases were looked at pubmed google scholar jstage and korea med and the time period is from inception of databases that is 1960s to december 2021 these were the search terms that were used sjogren syndrome and renal tubular acidosis or hypokalemic paralysis or interstitial nephritis or osteomalacia uh, foreign language publications were translated using google lens google translate and deepl translate now coming to the inclusion criteria and definitions that were used so a case report was included only if data pertaining to characteristic of renal tubular acidosis and diagnosis of sjogren syndrome were available and for diagnosis of sjogren syndrome uh, as professor hal mentioned uh, the gold standard is fission diagnosis so the fission diagnosis of sjogren syndrome was accepted if this was supported by either the presence of a positive antibody or histopathological positivity now uh, this i also looked at how many of these patients fulfill the acr eula 2016 classification criteria however it would be unfair to use this classification criteria for patients who were reported in the previous years so uh, to make it a level playing field i have slightly modified this criteria and uh, in addition to okla staining score that is item 3 of this criteria rose bengal staining has also been included this is because rose bengal staining was used 
previously. And similarly, in addition to unstimulated whole salivary flow, that is item 5 of the criteria, silography or scintigraphy, which was used in earlier years, was included. Now, uh, coming to definitions used for renal tubular residuosis, we know that both distal and proximal RTA are characterized by hyperchloremic non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. Distal RTA is characterized by urinary pH more than 5.5, whereas proximal RTA is characterized by urine pH less than 5.5. In case this was not mentioned, uh, looked at other additional findings to support the diagnosis of distal or proximal. For example, positive acid loading test, positive urine anion gap, presence of nephrocalcinosis, hypocitraturia, hypercalciuria, and fractional excretion of bicarbonate less than 5% supports the diagnosis of distal RTA. Uh, proximal RTA is supported by fractional excretion of bicarbonate more than 15 percentage and presence of Fanconi syndrome. Now this is the schematic summarizing the curation of publications. The unique publications identified from different databases, uh, duplicates were removed, total of 560 abstracts were screened, uh, 200 studies were excluded and finally there were 360 publications and from this 360 publications uh, there was information on 440 patients with both Sjogren's syndrome and renal tubular acidosis. There were 102 non-English language case reports, uh, mostly Japanese, French, Korean, Chinese, Spanish, Turkish and the remaining as listed. Now this is the geography distribution of 440 published cases. As can be seen here, the most uh, number of cases come from India uh, and China is 30. So I am no way suggesting that India has more cases than China. Uh, I could not access the Chinese database and China has so many cases they would not be reporting individual case reports. Having said that, what can be seen in this map is that the majority of cases of Sjogren's syndrome renal tubular residuosis are from Asia, 64 percentage, though it is also reported from across the world. And I also looked at the departments reporting these cases. Number one, medicine, followed by nephrology, rheumatology, endo, and neuro. Okay, coming to the results, other results. So, uh, first the demography. The median age of these patients was 37. If you remember from Professor Hal's talk, the median age of onset of Sjogren's syndrome, they have said 50 to 60. In India, we have shown that the diagnosis proceeds by a decade. So that is 40 years, but you can see this age is even lesser. And ranging from 6 to 78. So as young as 6 year old has Sjogren's syndrome with renal tubular acidosis. 24 patients were less than 16 years, that is 5.5 percentage, and close to 6 percentage patients were greater than 65 years. Women contributed 95.5 percentage, which is expected. 11 were pregnant at the time of diagnosis of Sjogren's syndrome with renal tubular acidosis. Concurrent autoimmune disease seen in these patients were lupus in 9, scleroderma in 3, rheumatoid arthritis in 2, mixed connective tissue disease in 1. And talking about the criteria features of Sjogren's syndrome, ocular or oral Sika symptoms was reported in 63.7 percentage only. But if you look at the objective testing, positive ocular testing was seen in 77.3 percentage, positive oral test in 96 percentage. Please look at the denominator here. Positive oral test, uh, oral tests were done only in 128. That is a very small percentage. This was the least performed test, but you can see the high yield in oral testing. That is 123 out of 120, that is 96 percentage. Anti-SSA antibody positive is 93.9, anti-SSP in 78.6, and positive minor salivary gland biopsy in 91.8. So what I want to emphasize is that even when they do not have very obvious Sika symptoms, there is high percentage of objective testing, so there should be no doubt regarding the diagnosis of Sjogren's syndrome in these patients. And not surprising, that only 7.7 percentage had a prior diagnosis of Sjogren's because these patients would not have sought medical attention for their very subtle Sika symptoms, which was easily elicitable in history. Now, uh, looking at uh, the criteria, ACG criteria was fulfilled only by 54.5 percentage patients, ACR ULAR with modification in 81.4 percentage, and most of these people, uh, and if you look at why they have not fulfilled criteria, because the evaluation for criteria features were incomplete in all 82 patients not fulfilling the criteria, and of these 82 patients, minor salivary gland biopsy was not done in 74, and evaluation for sicker signs was lacking in 90. 
Now, if you look at the frequency of presenting complaints of RTA, the most common presenting complaint is hypokalemic paralysis. This was seen in 280 patients and multiple, 110 patients had to suffer multiple episodes of hypokalemic paralysis before the diagnosis could be made. So, what I suggest is that the hypokalemic paralysis patients are not going to come to rheumatologist. They would be seen by our colleagues. We need to take the phone and call them and tell that if they see hypokalemic paralysis, all patients need to be evaluated for RTA and if there is RTA, they need to be evaluated for Sjogren's syndrome. I am not suggesting all patients with hypokalemic paralysis have RTA, but there could be a significant percentage that could have a diagnosis of Sjogren's RTA and this would be an opportunity to diagnose Sjogren's syndrome, renal tubular acidosis. There are a lot of other features which are probably non-specific and may not be worthwhile investing detailed evaluation. Now, uh, talking about the frequency and types of RTA and complications, type 1 was the most common, 387, type 2 in uh, 8, both type 1 and 2 were found in 38, hyperkalemic in 3, Fanconi syndrome in 45, renal biopsy showed tubular interstitial nephritis in 142 out of 152 patients in whom the biopsy was done. Now, talking about the other renal features, low EGFR was found in 45.4 percentage, proteinuria in 64.7 percentage, nephrocalcinosis and stones in 30 plus, osteomalacia in 59 percentage, and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus was described in 21 patients. Now, the other point I would like to emphasize in this slide is that if you look at the denominator, it appears that all renal tubular residuosis patients are not evaluated for all the other complications. So, this is another message which I would say, when we see a patient with Sjogren's syndrome renal tubular residuosis, we should look for all the different renal aspects. Now, talking about the non-renal Sjogren's syndrome features seen in this uh, uh, population, Parotitis was seen in 43, purpura in 30, neurological involvement in 20, liver involvement in 16, pancreatitis in 11, lung in 13, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia in 11 and 5 respectively. So I also came across something very unique. Uh, central pontine myelinolysis or osmotic demyelination syndrome was overrepresented and it is not described in literature as a characteristic feature of either Sjogren's or renal tubular acidosis. So I have... Um, Along with uh, Japanese co-authors, we have written a paper on this and this is uh, the abstract is submitted at IRACON. It is poster number 114 for those who are interested. Now, talking about the etiology for Sjogren's syndrome, renal tubular restosis, we know that uh, usually in all autoimmune disease, we consider either environmental factors or genetic factors. Now, because all these case reports are from Asia, most people from the West tend to think that this is because of oriental medicine or the herbs that our patients take. If that be the case, we should have rheumatoid arthritis and lupus patients presenting with RTA, not Sjogren's syndrome. So, if uh, in this case reports I have looked at, uh, if there was any mention about these. So, what I can, uh, only two people have reported and if you, but if you look at the genetic aspect, I found this very interesting. In four families, in 440 case reports, there were other members who had renal tubular acidosis. And then the case reports which I have not included in the study, also I looked at further and there are two families in a prospective study from India and three reports from Japan, which again has family history of Sjogren's syndrome with renal tubular acidosis. Now, case report comes at the lowest uh, base of our evidence pyramid and I know there are a lot of limitations in this research. Uh, the literature search, publication bias, single author review bias, and because it is spanning over a long time period, different criteria in use, different specialties, so there is a lot of heterogeneity. But I think uh, we can make some conclusions. There is younger median age, but this condition is seen in extremes of age as well. Subclinical sicker features, but objective features with high positivity. RTA is one of the earliest manifestations of Sjogren's syndrome. Hypokalemic paralysis should be considered an opportunity for early diagnosis, mostly distal, but it could also be because proximal dysfunction is not evaluated often. High percentage of proteinuria, low EGFR, and nephrocalcinosis calculus, osteomalacia, possibly these are evaluated infrequently. So, uh, I have uh, published this. this. This has been accepted for publication in IGRD. So, please consider this as my job application. I would like to collaborate with everyone to put together data on Sjogren's syndrome, renal tubular acidosis. If anybody sees any cases, I would really appreciate if you would email me. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sandhya. I think it's one of the most comprehensive uh, 
literature review on renal tubular acidosis and this is data we should cherish and uh, use and I think we should start referring all these patients uh, at least the data to Dr. Sandhya. I think that will be the takeaway message here. I'll 